සුපින් අධිවේග පරදා ඔබ මවිත කරවන වේගයක් බිඳ ගන්න. පීවර තුලකින් ශ්‍රී ලංකා ටෙලිකොම් ෆයිබර් ඔප්ටික් ජාලයට එක් වන්න. slp.lk වෙත පිවිසෙන්න. Making headlines on first at 9. Diverging views. UNESCO officials confirmed that the Gold International Stadium was not on the radar during the last committee meeting. In any case at any point there is no decision to shift the stadium or committee decision or to put this property in list of danger. Minister Gila Viraj insists otherwise. High time. Global Sri Lankan Forum stresses that the government should withdraw the co-sponsorship of the UN resolution, paving the way for its full withdrawal. The government should take necessary steps in the next session or the session after to withdraw their co-sponsorship. Minority rights. Former President Chandrika Bandaranaga Kumar Tunga calls for a constitutional amendment to legally secure rights of minorities. Diplomatic ties. China pledges to boost the development of the Belt and Road Initiative to strengthen pragmatic cooperation with Sri Lanka and its military. When nature strikes, wildfire in Greece, dam bursts in Laos and heat wave in Japan. Disasters claim hundreds of lives across the globe. A very good evening to you and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Katharina Chang. Now on to your top story tonight. The Gold International Stadium has been making news on matters other than cricket in the past week, with the government claiming that alleged illegal constructions within the stadium is threatening the golf fort's UNESCO World Heritage status. UNESCO official Dr. Garmin Vijay Surya today revealed that UNESCO in fact has not informed the Sri Lankan government that Gaul International Stadium or its buildings should be removed or relocated. Speaking exclusively to First at Nine, Dr. Vijay Surya emphasized that the risk of Gaul Fort being removed from the list of UNESCO's World Heritage Sites was not mentioned during the 42nd session of the World Heritage Committee this year. Recent reports which came into circulation claim UNESCO informed the Sri Lankan government that buildings constructed at the Gold International Cricket Stadium, including the main pavilion, have threatened the conservation work of the area concerning the Gold Fort and therefore it is in danger of being removed from the UNESCO World Heritage List. The latest list of World Heritage sites that are at risk of losing their status, however, does not include the Gold International Cricket Stadium. In this backdrop, Secretary General of UNESCO Sri Lanka, La Ranavira, also said to other Dharana earlier this week that no recommendation was made to relocate the Gore Stadium, but the Mahindra Rajapaksha Sports Pavilion and two other pavilions on either sides of the Rajapaksha Pavilion should be removed as they are considered unauthorized constructions. Responding to questions at a media briefing today, Minister Klaviraj Karivasam also expressed sentiments in line with views of the Secretary General of UNESCO Sri Lanka. The UNESCO asked to remove certain buildings and constructions of the Gaul International Stadium as they pose a threat to the Gaul Fort, which is a World Heritage Site. They even gave a time period for this purpose. It was during the tenure of former President Mahindra Rajpaksha that these constructions were done without any concern for the situation. We only need to remove the pavilion. They have clearly conveyed that to us. However, in stark contrast to these views, Deputy Coordinator on Matters of World Heritage of the UNESCO's International Centre for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, based in Rome, Dr. Garmani Vijay Surya had this to say to First at Nine today. The most important document is the last committee decision, which took place in uh, Bahrain uh, in July this year. This decision makes no reference to goal stadium or the pavilion because the focus has been shifted to other issues more details about the proposed port development which has at the moment uh, delayed and then about uh, tourism plan and then about staffing of uh, the institutions like the Gold Heritage Foundation and so on. And uh, the committee has requested the Sri Lanka government to work on these issues and report back by December 
2019. Only in 2013, the, the committee has requested some details about what they are planning with regard to the stadium. Before that, there was an issue of building new structures in the gold stadium. There was a discussion and whether, we, whether they disturb the view of the gold fort and so on. What is important to remember here is that the stadium is located outside the World Heritage property, which is the gold fort, and this is in the buffer zone. Buffer zone is an extra layer of protection. In any case, at any point, there's no decision to shift the stadium or committee decision or to put this property in list of danger. There's no uh, issue for goal at the moment. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka cricketing legend and former captain Mahila Jawardhana also expressed views on the matter during an interview with the BBC's Singhala service. I understand the historic value of the goal fort. But this stadium has been there for a long time, and if the problem here is removing certain buildings of the stadium, we can easily sort it out. We need to stop looking at this from a political angle. There are enough international cricket stadiums in the country, and we need to focus on making most of these facilities for the progress of the sport in the country. Meanwhile, the issue of the Gaul International Stadium was taken up by the Southern Provincial Council, where a tense situation was erupted. Military, naval and air attache of the Chinese embassy in Sri Lanka, Senior Colonel Zhu Jianwei says that China aims to boost the development of Belt and Road Initiative to strengthen the pragmatic cooperation between the two countries and two militaries. He expressed these views at the 91st founding anniversary of the People's Liberation Army held yesterday. The 91st founding anniversary of the People's Liberation Army organized by the Embassy of China in Sri Lanka was held under the auspices of the Secretary of the Ministry of Defence, President's Council Kapilavai Ratna last evening. Among those who attended the event was former President Mahindra Rajapaksha. The People's Republic of China has always been a valuable and a close partner for Sri Lanka and the two nations have enjoyed bilateral relations for almost 61 years, supporting each other in the regional and international sphere while making efforts to deepen the pragmatic cooperation. However, it is in the 21st century that bilateral relations grew stronger than ever. It remains that we are yet to reap the full benefits of all Chinese concurrences in the island. Chinese military attaches great importance to improving relations with Sri Lankan military. This year, China will continue to provide various training courses for Tri Forces to complete building Chinese funded auditorium complex at the Sri Lanka Military Academy and make preparations to hand over a gift frigate to Sri Lankan Navy. China is willing to enhance mutual strategic trust and is keen to see both countries continue supporting each other on issues of core interest. China wishes to boost the development of Belt and Road Initiative to strengthen the pragmatic cooperation between the two countries and the two militaries. Global Sri Lankan Forum urges the government to commence the process of withdrawing its core sponsorship of the Resolution 30-1 brought against Sri Lanka at the United Nations Human Rights Commission. They hinge their argument on the United Nations not having any scope to intervene during a situation where international humanitarian law prevails, as it did when the resolution was first brought back in 2009. At the 38th session of the UNHRC, the main matter that we took up is actually that the UNHRC did not have a right or did not have a legal right to pass that resolution 30-1 against Sri Lanka, which was co-sponsored by the government of Sri Lanka. The reason why we are saying that is the situation that prevailed immediately before the end of the war in 18th May 2009 can qualify under the international law as an armed conflict. Armed conflict is a situation where there are two or more parties are fighting against each other using heavy weapons and other things and the armed conflict will exist until it comes to a normalcy. 
So in a situation of armed conflict, the applicable branch of the international law is international humanitarian law. In case where the international humanitarian law is applicable, there is no jurisdiction or there is no scope for the United, United Nations Human Rights Commission. The government should take necessary steps in the next session or the session after to withdraw their co-sponsorship. Whoever contests for the next presidential election in 2019 or 2020 should take this matter to the public and ask for a public mandate by using their election manifesto that they are going to withdraw this 30 slash one resolution and the co-sponsors given by the previous government. So what we are asking the JO and the other members of the UEFA and also patriotic UMP members support and then we do at the international level. It is the responsibility of the government. Former President Chandrika Bandar Naik Kumar Tunga calls for the legal protection of the rights of all minorities in Sri Lanka. The former president insists that constitutional amendments of a new constitution should be brought in as a means to ensure the rights of minorities. She expressed these views at an event held in Colombo this morning. The National Interreligious Symposium was held under the auspices of former president Chandrika Bandarnaika Kumartunga this morning. If the rights of all minorities who are part of other religious sects are protected through legal measures, then it must be done by making amendments to the constitution. This means we require these amendments. It does not matter to me what other amendments they wish to include, but this must be done. The government said they will do this, but they are moving at a snail's pace. Former President Mahindra Rajapaksha today hit back at the notion that media freedom was lost during his tenure. He says that if the media lost their freedom during his tenure, then the cabinet of ministers who were with him during this period should also be held accountable. The former president expressed these views to media following an event today. The launch of the book titled Bhupati Dutugamuno Janapati Mahinda authored by Professor Raja Dharmapala was held under the auspices of former President Mahinda Rajapaksa in Papiliana today. Elections are now over, which is why he is making such statements. You will see how the tone changes when elections near. He was in the very same government. If media freedom was lost, he should be held accountable as well. The media knows what the true story is. What lies? It is wrong to say that a president lied, but it is a false statement. I have given my response to this. Even the Chinese ambassador gave his statement regarding the matter. I will make a statement in parliament regarding this issue once the prime minister fulfills his promise to tell us what happened with Arjuna Mahendran and the bond case. The Sri Lanka Podujana Perumuna Professor GLP Riz today accused the Speaker of the Parliament for acting in the breach in, of his duties by not arranging the debate on the report of the Delimitation Commission within the required time period. Addressing a media briefing in Colombo today, Professor Pires also warned the government not to implement the free trade agreement between Sri Lanka and Singapore until a complete public debate, which explores all of its pros and cons, is held. What is now known substantially as the ECTA agreement was then referred to as SEPA. When this agreement was about to be signed, there was very vigorous opposition from local trade chambers. The stand of the Mahindra Rajapaksa government was very clear. And the government decided not to sign the SEPA agreement until hearing and considering the views of various sections of the Sri Lankan community who had vigorous objections to that agreement in that form. Free trade agreement with Singapore runs into more than a thousand pages, let alone the public of Sri Lanka and the industrialists in this country, not even members of parliament are fully informed of the content of this agreement. 
because it's only the English copy that has been presented to Parliament. We would be deluding ourselves. Members of Parliament have a grasp of even the basic issues that are contained in this agreement. This should not be implemented in a hurry. It should be postponed until there is full debate in the country, the pros and the cons. Professor G.L. Pires also touched on the delay in holding provincial council elections. The other thing the government is doing is postponing elections indefinitely. That state of things is giving rise to legal issues as well. The chairman of the elections commission has said that the provincial council elections in uh, three provinces where the provincial councils are expiring their terms this year and three other provinces where the provincial council ceased to exist 10 months ago can be held on the 5th of January next year, but that is subject to the condition that the electoral system is agreed upon by parliament before the end of October. We have no confidence at all that that will be done. The Speaker of Parliament has certainly been in breach of his duties in not arranging for the debate on the report of the delimitation commission to be held in parliament within the time frame that is stipulated by the law. So that is why the joint opposition has decided to launch a massive agitation campaign in the country saying don't steal the right of the people to vote. How can a country where elections do not take place at regular intervals be described as a democratic country even at the basic level? The United National Party alleges that the Government Medical Officers Association is harboring an agenda to topple the government. The party says that GMOA has resorted to bringing false rumours on the Sri Lanka-Singapore free trade agreement into circulation in a bid to achieve this end. The remark was made by Deputy Minister of Environment Ajit Manna Peruma while addressing a media briefing which was held at the UMP headquarters Sirikota this morning. I heard doctors calling for a strike in the recent past. Injections were brought into the country with pieces of glass inside. Substandard medicines were imported. Did the doctors go on strike asking for drugs with superior quality? Seneca Bibili Pharmaceuticals policy was delayed for a long time. Did they strike? They talk about jobs of others instead of talking about theirs. How can they speak about the country's economy? There are experts who know about the subject and therefore we would like to tell the doctors to move for trade union action in relation to their own field. They were like kittens during the Rajapaksha regime. They were silent over substandard drugs, lack of facilities in hospitals and high prices of stents. It is not out of ignorance that they criticise the Singapore FTA. They are in league with thieves who have cases pending in courts. The thieves know very well that a case will take at least five years in court and they want to topple the government before the five-year tenure of the government ends. The Colombo High Court today reissued notice on President Maitri Pala Sirisena and Prime Minister Rani Rikma Singh to appear before court on the 9th of October pertaining to the case filed against former General Secretary of the UMP, Tissa Atanayaka, over making a forged document public. The court had previously issued notices on both the President and the Prime Minister to appear before court today. When the case was taken up, however, Deputy Solicitor General Dilip Papiris appearing on behalf of the Attorney General informed court that the President and the Premier had notified in writing their inability to appear before court due to the Cabinet meeting scheduled today. Therefore, the Deputy Solicitor General stated that if the President and the Prime Minister are unable to appear for the next meeting or hearing, a different witness will be called and the trial would commence. High Court Judge Vikum Kalwarachi said delaying the court hearing in such a manner is an injustice towards the defendant as they deserve a quick and fair trial. The court reissued notices on the President and the Prime Minister to appear before court on the 9th of October. Director General of the Commission to Investigate Bribery or Corruption, Sarah Jayamana, says it is important to amend the Bribery Act in order to facilitate cooperation between the police, the Bribery Commission and other investigations. Bribery law, only the public servants are guilty for bribery. Unfortunately, the private sector is not included. So definitely, like all other countries, we are going to include private sector bribery. If a foreign official gives us a bribe, it is not an offence in this country. So therefore, we have to uh, include foreign officials privately. And the other important thing is uh, when it comes to the Commission Act, uh, we have to have provision that will allow us to share our information with uh, other investigators like uh, FCID, CID, because there is a, uh, there is a prohibition 
uh, in our act that says we can't divert any progress of the investigation. That is why when media asks about our investigation, we don't divert. With these amendments, we are going to share our information with other police agencies. Why? Because our mandate is to conduct investigation into bribery, corruption and assets. But the police have the mandate with regard to all other offences. So therefore, there has to be a proper coordination between these agencies. Meanwhile, the Commission to Investigate Bribery or Corruption will co-host the Global Expert Group meeting on Jakarta principles with UNODC and UNDP Sri Lanka. The meeting will be held for three days, commencing from tomorrow in Colombo. There will be experts from UNODC. Uh, they will come. They are working on the UNCAC, meaning United Nations Convention Against Corruption. In that particular convention, there are two articles, and those articles entrust the responsibility of all those state parties to come out with all the provisions with regard to independence. And now this Jakarta declaration that came in 2012, that was a sequel to the 2004 convention. After these three days, there will be a Kalambu commentary and it will give the practical modalities how to implement this Jakarta declaration. Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Welcome back to the news. Chairman of the Colombo Stock Exchange, Ray Abe Warden, says the necessary groundwork and processes have already been laid out to welcome the demutualization of the Colombo Stock Exchange. Speaking exclusively to First at Nine, Abe Warden revealed that the CSC expects no less than a few weeks for the necessary legislation to come into effect as it is currently being fast-tracked. However, experts say that the successful implementation of the bill depends on the right timing and bringing an independent strategic investor into the equation. One of the most visible changes, the introduction of the demutualization bill to the stock exchange will see the inst its institution convert from not-for-profit, member-owned organizations to for-profit, shareholder-owned corporate entities. Demutualization, which is the process of converting stock exchanges from not-for-profit, member-owned organizations to for-profit, shareholder-owned corporate entities, which have been taking place across the world since the early 1990s. Sri Lanka, however, remains the only South Asian country with a mutualized stock exchange. According to the Sri Lanka Capital Market Assessment Report, published in 2016 by the Asian Development Bank, it was recommended that Sri Lanka undertake substantial and challenging structural and policy reforms in order to establish a well-functioning financial system if the country is to achieve the equity market capitalization from 32% to 66% of the GDP by 2020, laid out by the SEC 2020 vision. As part of the strategy laid out to achieve growth in the capital market is the proposal of the demutualization of the Colombo Stock Exchange, which requires parliamentary approval. It is to this end, in March earlier this year, State Minister of National Policies and Economic Affairs Dr. Harshadi Silva tabled the demutualization bill for its third reading. Speaking to First at Nine, Chairman of the CSC said that it is expected that the bill would be presented in Parliament during the next parliamentary debate. Share allocation, however, is likely to be one of the biggest issues of demutualization between the 15 members of the CSC and the Capital Market Development Fund. As of now and as we are aware, it is on a 60-40 basis. So we do not know in what form that it will be presented to Parliament. Uh, in the meantime, we have also the Colombo Stock Exchange has taken the opportunity in the time available to propose to the SEC uh, certain amendments uh, which we have already sent them, hoping that they'll take cognizance of some of the salient features of what we have proposed. Abhivardhan added, with the demutualization bill being fast-tracked, they expect a smooth transition within the stock exchange. The process is already laid out, so I think it will be more or less seamless. We know of what happens once the Demutualization Act gets passed in Parliament. There are laid down uh, guidelines of what takes place once the demutualization of the stock exchange takes place. Meanwhile, business cycle analyst 
Dr. Kenneth De Silva said that as much as the demutualization bill is welcomed by its stakeholders, the timing in which it's implemented should be taken into consideration. So the question of timing becomes critical in this demutualization process because the stock exchange is at its lowest in many years. So the valuation for such uh, uh, IPO becomes an issue and that's something that the government needs to really get its hands on because we don't want to see a fire sale type of strategy being adopted like we are seeing in many other national assets and strategic assets per se. Former Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission Dr. Aritha Vikramanayaka said that the success of the demutualization depends on bringing an independent strategic investor. The success of the demutualization will depend on the ability to bring an independent strategic investor into the process. And bringing an independent strategic investor is not easy. It will require an environment in which there is no infighting. Nobody is going to come into a market where the brokers are fighting amongst themselves or the brokers are fighting with the regulator. So you've got to make sure that everybody's interests are fairly treated and that people go into it, that people buy into this whole process of change and do it in the overall interest of everybody. It can't be a you against me fight here. If that happens, it will just be disaster. Sri Lankan shares extended their fall for a second straight session, easing further from a three-week closing high recorded last week, but foreign buying helped limit losses. In your currency market now, the Sri Lanka rupee held steady against the US dollar today, with the rupee closing at 159.55 cents to 60 cents against the US dollar in the spot market upon export conversions. Let's take a look at the day's forex rates. Premier News Channel, other than 24-7. At least 50 people are feared dead in wildfires burning near Athens as Greece faces its worst fire crisis in more than a decade. According to the Red Cross, 26 bodies were found in the yard of a villa in the seaside village of Mati, which is at the centre of the disaster. This is one of the several fires that broke out in the country amid a sweltering heat wave. Charred bodies were seen on a narrow road clogged with cars heading to the safe haven of a nearby beach. Dozens of people scrambled into the ocean as the blaze raged close to the shore and they were picked up by passing boats. Greece said it needed air and land assets from its European Union partners. Meanwhile, hundreds of people are missing and an unknown number dead after a dam which was under construction collapsed in southeast Laos. Local media said that the collapse at the hydroelectric dam in Atepeo province late yesterday sent flash floods through six villages. More than 6,600 people have been made homeless, while pictures showed villagers stranded on the roofs of submerged houses and boats carrying people to safety. The reason for the collapse of the dam is not clear and its construction began in 2013 with power generation due to start this year. The incident follows heavy rains and flooding across southern Laos. Japan's weather agency has declared a heat wave sweeping the country, a natural disaster with at least 65 deaths recorded in the past week. Yesterday, the city of Kumagaya reported a temperature of 41.1 degrees Celsius, the highest ever recorded in Japan. In central Tokyo, temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius were also registered for the first time. Over 200 people in Yokohama's Chinatown splashed water on the streets and pavements in the hopes of providing some relief from the heat as temperatures nationwide rose to record highs yesterday and the death toll mounted to over 65 in the last week. Since the 16th of July, at least 65 people have died of heat stroke and over 20,000 have been hospitalized.
U.S. President Donald Trump is said to be considering revoking security clearance for ex-CIA boss John Brennan and other Obama-era critics of him, including ex-FBI Director James Comey. The White House named six former intelligence, law enforcement and national security chiefs. The president is exploring the mechanisms to remove security clearance because they've politicized and in some cases monetized their public service and security clearances, making baseless accusations of improper contact with Russia or being influenced by Russia against the president is extremely inappropriate. Sri Lanka Cricket Today announced the appointment of former cricketer Charit Sena Naika as Sri Lanka team manager for the upcoming five-match one-day series against South Africa. His opponent, uh, appointment rather, will be in effect from the 25th of July to the 30th September this year. Sena Naika will function as the team manager of the national team up until the conclusion of the Asia Cup, which will be played in September. The first ODI gets underway on the 29th of July at Tambulla. Twelve-time Olympic medalist Ryan Lochter says he is devastated by his 14-month ban from a doping violation. The 33-year-old American has been sanctioned by the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency for an intravenous infusion. The U.S. Anti-Doping Agency said in a statement that Lochter has posted an image on social media showing himself receiving an infusion of permitted substances and that a subsequent investigation revealed this exceeded permissible levels. While Lochte was not using a banned substance, U.S. Uh, ADA said intravenous infusions or injections in excess of 100 milliliter within a 12-hour period and without a therapeutic use exemption are prohibited unless legitimately received in the course of hospital treatment. The 33-year-old's period of ineligibility began on the 24th of May, the date of infusion. You are watching. Sri Lanka's number one news channel, other than a 24-7. Manusha Jayat, like I said, the development center with your forecast first. A very good evening, everyone, and welcome to Forecast First. It will be a scorching day in the northern and eastern provinces tomorrow with the temperatures hitting as high as 36 degrees Celsius in the Batiklo district. It is, however, the tourist season for those areas, so holiday makers are in for a treat. In contrast, much milder temperatures are to be expected in the central hills uh, with the numbers dipping as low as 20 degrees Celsius. Moving on to your forecast now, interestingly, thunder showers are also forecast in the eastern province where things will be rather hot during the peak time of the day. There will be light showers in the central province as well, but most other parts of the country will see sunny weather tomorrow. That's it from your weather center tonight. Up next is your city by city focus. And with that, we conclude this edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining us and have a pleasant evening.